points for last year, 2013. And I recognize that there will be many questions and statements from members of the public, elected officials, and representatives. So I will only take a few minutes to introduce a few folks here and make a couple of short remarks. At the table, I have brought some of the staff of Region 1, including Mike Scott on my right. He is the Deputy Director for the Division of Reactive Projects. Uh, Mike has responsibility for all of the resident inspectors in the Northeast. I have on my left, Art Bird, who is the Branch Chief of the Division and has responsibility for oversight of Indian Point. And to my far left is Scott Stewart, who is the Senior Resident Inspector at Indian Point. Uh, Scott lives in the area and conducts independent inspections on a daily basis. I have also brought a number of other folks uh, from our regional office and headquarters. I won't introduce them all uh, just to save time. I do want to introduce you to the other two resident inspectors who have been stationed at the site, uh, Gavin Newman and Abhin Patel. Now we brought all these individuals here tonight to provide answers to as many questions as we can. And for those that we don't have immediate answers, we'll follow up and get back to you. Now we have taken some of the feedback in the past and no longer have a specific presentation to discuss plant performance. Uh, that said, <clears throat> I hope you take advantage of the open house uh, that was just conducted to discuss our assessment of the licensee's performance. And additionally, we have slides of our assessment in the back of the other room uh, with contact information should you have any questions. Now, with respect to Indian Point's performance in 2013, the two plants operated safely with no issues created in the which means issues identified were of low significance. We reached that conclusion based on extensive independent inspections by our regional staff some of whom are here today, insights from my allegations and investigation programs, licensing reviews and audits by our headquarters staff, and review of performance indicators and other duties that we've developed. We've had a substantial inspection footprint at the site with over 9,500 hours of inspection and inspection-related activities, much more than the typical two-unit site. But even with good performance by the YCC last year, we continue to have an appropriately rigorous oversight regime as called for by our reactor oversight process. We continue to monitor and inspect the licensee's fire protection program with a recent inspection to follow up on the licensee's modifications to address fire protection operator manual actions. We continue to inspect license renewal commitments and aging management programs to ensure that they are still being met while, while the license renewal process is ongoing and unit two is in timely renewal. And we continue to review the plant's activities with respect to Fukushima lessons learned with a recent 13 person audit of the licensee's flooding evaluation. And earlier this year, we issued escalating enforcement actions against Entergy and an ex-chemistry manager for falsifying test results for diesel fuel. For that issue, our staff investigated the issue, shared our results with the Department of Justice, coordinated them on criminal and civil actions, and again, <clears throat> you know, we uh, do extensive amount of uh, inspection, inspection and oversight at the site. And we will continue to do that to ensure that the plan is operating safely and that the public, and safe, public health and safety is protected. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to welcome you. And I'm going to turn over to the facilitator, Michelle Marsh. Good evening. My name is Michelle Marsh. I'm a, a neutral outside party. I've been brought in by a company called Santiva. And I am absolutely honored to serve as your facilitator this evening. I would guess there are probably about 300, maybe two or 300 of you here this evening, and over 80 of you have put in forms and requested to speak. I want nothing more than all of you who have asked to have that opportunity. So I'm completely committed to creating a process and hopefully an environment and an atmosphere where we can have as many of you participate as possible. Mic check. Mic check. Mic check. Mic check. 
A public meeting. A public, public meeting. meeting should have a public record. Should, should have a public, public record. record. A public meeting. A public meeting. Public record, and there's no record being kept. There's no, no record, record being, being kept. kept. And I thought the grannies were the only clowns. Thank you, Gary. So these are your two hours. And what I want to do, what I want to do is I, again, I want to have as many of you speak as possible. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, again, offer a process and an atmosphere. And here's, here's how I think we can do this together. We're going to take just a few minutes for a few announcements and introductions. And then we're going to divide the meeting into two parts. The first part will have three separate subjects. These subjects were offered to me by stakeholders who are here present this evening. Again, if you would like to know who the stakeholders are, I would ask them to raise their hands and they can be recognized because there were plenty of you involved. Thank you. Thank you. So here's what I'm going to do. So we're going to cover. We want to talk about the issues that we care about. And they're not for you to decide. You don't even live here. So what I'm going to offer is. We're the ones who are getting a higher rate of cancer because of this. We no, you're not. The project is a lie. So let me ask you, do you want to do this all night, or would you like to have people come up and speak? Let's hear the public and say what they want to say. We can do that. We're not going to fold in to your agenda. This is a public meeting for the public stakeholders. You are not the person to decide. Let me just try one more thing. Because I'm on your side. What I'd like to talk you can talk. Are you talking about one of those three issues that they've decided we should be talking about? No, you should be talking about. And you just try to do it. We want this to be clear. But if you are going to scream and howl and yell, you are not going to let me make my statement. That's right.
Ken O'Keen, and Eileen Mayhood. If you guys would queue up at the mic. Oh, shit. I'd like for you each to keep your time to two minutes, if you don't mind, so that we can have more people speak. To help with the process, when we get about a minute and a half in, I'll wave to you. And if you can wrap up in the last 30 seconds, that'll keep the ball rolling and we can, again, have more people speak. All right? So, Sheila. Yeah, Sheila. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start. Bring the mic to the microphone. I mean, at the, at the last uh, few meetings that I've been at, uh, there was hair raising uh, announcements about all kinds of exceptions to safety procedures that were granted. And uh, one of the things I'd like you to do is clarify why you exempt people from these procedures. Uh, this is something that we uh, find rather uh, dubious as a procedure. Uh, the second thing is the uh, condition of the uh, nuclear wastes. Uh, as I understand it, some of the um, waste uh, is in the dry cask storage of Indian corn. How much? I'd like to find out. Uh, I didn't get an answer last year, and I think hope that there is uh, more going on. With the recent uh, resolution of the NRC, um, I gather you're not running to do more, and I would like to know why. And I think it's very dangerous, I said I disagree with that resolution that the you know, open funds is safe. During Sandy, uh, I listened to the weather reports, I, I was on high ground so I could pay attention, and the storm surge came within inches of the fuel pump. And so uh, all you need is another heavy rain with the extreme weather coming down, we can't predict what we're getting. You know, the assessment of what's safe, these things are not safe. So that I want to know what you're doing to convert this to dry cast storage. I want this place shut down. I want to know where the money is for decommissioning. I want to know how much there is. Has it kept up with inflation? Is it going to be available? How long will it take? And does that cover the um, conversion of the waste as well as the plant itself? Uh, the uh, third thing has to do with the vulnerability of the site. Okay. We know that it's on two four blocks. So it's not only extreme weather that we have to worry about, but it's the um, volcanic uh, conditions, the earthquakes. So, um, and we find that there are more earthquakes happening every now and then uh, around the country in areas that they didn't have them before, partly due to fracking. But, you know, we can't count that the old the rules are still applying with this change. So I want to know what you're doing to make me safe. And I don't find any of what I've heard so far this year from the accounts that have come out in the newspapers or from your own reports. So I am very disturbed about this. So thank you. you. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Fifteen minutes of questions and, and, and comments, then and then they'll respond. That way, you guys will have more time to talk and less back and forth. So go ahead. And go fewer ahead. answers. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. If you want answers in writing, we Go ahead. Okay. So my name is Eileen Mohit Jose, and I was here last year. And before I start speaking about any of the I just wanted to bring up that. Commissioner Dean was here. Okay. Commissioner Dean was here, and I brought up that OPG wants to build nuclear waste vaults on the boundary between the United States and Canada under Lake Huron. And um, he said he didn't know about it, which I thought was really strange because the joint panel was going to start within a matter of months listening to people have their testimony. So he asked me to contact him and I tried over the internet and I wasn't able to. So I wrote their website and an email address on Mr. Williams' nameplate. If you could just give that to Commissioner Dean. Because you guys should know if they're going to build a low and intermediate waste vault on the boundary between Canada and the United States, if you indeed are protecting us in the environment. So, okay, that said, back to Indian Point. Okay, can we wrap up in about 30 seconds? Sure, sure. 
So on the card, I ask how much spent fuel is being stored at any point so far. Because I understand in the United States, these fuel pools are overcrowded sometimes three or four times beyond their, divine, their design specs. So I wanted to ask about that. And over the past few months, I've been hearing a lot about high burnout fuel that these fuel rods are running hotter and longer, and therefore they need to be transferred to another dry cask at some point in their storage cycle. And that's never been done. It's never been attempted. So my last question is, if these rods are running longer and harder and hotter, what is the plan to safeguard this for a quarter of a million years? Thank you. Thank you very good. Keep up, Abe Levy and Gary Shaw, if you guys could get in. My name is Ken Wilkin. I'm a resident of Briarcliff Manor, which is 10 miles radius, Indian Point. Um, I've lived in this area for almost 20 years, and I have to say that through all that time, uh, every night I go to bed and I pray that, that there is not going to be some kind of disaster that is occurring 10 miles away from me. Um, two years ago, or perhaps maybe a year ago, um, a young man came up the river in a boat, a motorboat, and spent probably an hour in front of Indian Point before he was even questioned as to why he was there. That same gentleman flew a plane a week later over Indian Point, small Piper Cub or whatever, um, and uh, flew that plane over and managed to circle around Indian Point and was never contested. So I have to say that uh, and this is kind of a preface to, to really where I'm getting to in terms of my question. Um, it's very clear that uh, we are all extremely vulnerable. Now, I, I realize that the day-to-day -day operations are being checked and uh, certain safety areas are being checked and so on. But just the presence of this plant within 30 miles of New York City, and 30 million people being vulnerable, their lives, and in addition to all of the, New York City is the economic center of this country. So even if there was a one half of 1% chance of something disastrous happening, we know that nature, uh, you know, has no bounds that um, you can see how many people here are particularly worried about this kind of thing and don't want to have it. So my preface to my question really having to do with the containment of the spent fuel pools, which is growing and growing and growing, and as the previous speaker uh, spoke about, and um, the fact that the spent fuel pool is covered by a corrugated metal roof, which is a roof that typically covers uh, any of these uh, big box stores. Can I get you to um, wrap up with your yeah. question? Because okay. I want to get so a lot of questions tonight. My question, tonight. My question you, is, how uh, is the, the issues that I've just raised here, how, have the, how can you address those issues in terms of our feeling safe here? Thank you. Ms. Mock, thank you for calling on me. I appreciate it. And I'll speak as quickly as I can, but I have a fairly broad agenda. And before I ask my question, I want to take a minute to let Administrator Dean, if he had been here, to know that this local homeowner and involved stakeholders extremely disturbed and angered by your arrogance and disregard for transparency by an agency that proves over and over again that it has placed its charter responsibility to the public far behind its promotion and protection of the nuclear industry. With all due respect to you, 
that NRC could hire a professional moderator who has virtually no knowledge of the issues while writing to me that a public record of public meetings is not a good use of NRC budget is a slap in the face to all the citizens yeah, yeah. living in the yeah. Yeah. and it's a cowardly and crass attempt to stifle communications so that relevant issues brought to the front by citizen stakeholders will not be known by other communities nor by the upper management of the agency. And I end this paragraph by saying he should be ashamed of himself. Yes, 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 yes. Other yes. First, as I'm sure you're all aware, in August 2011, a 5.8 magnitude earthquake occurred in Virginia with the epicenter approximately 11 miles from the North Anna nuclear plant. That event was felt in New York City and as far north as Rhode Island. I am also sure you were aware that that earthquake created ground wave vibrations that exceeded both design basis and operating basis for the North Anna plant. It cracked structures on the site and moved some of the massive multi-ton dry cast storage units. I assume you are also aware that the Indian Point nuclear plant was built in close proximity to the known Ramapo Fault, which is mind-boggling mind to begin with. And then Energy has stated multiple times that Indian Point was built to withstand a 6.1 magnitude seismic event. In 2008, seismologists of the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory of Columbia University identified a second fault that intersects the Ramapo within one mile of Indian Point, and these seismologists estimate potential for as high as a 7.0 magnitude seismic event. Here are my questions related to this issue. Can you confirm that Indian Point's reactor buildings are based on seismic tremor levels equated to a 6.1 event? Second, can you tell us what the seismic safety standards are for the spent fuel storage structures where over 2,700 tons of high-level wastes are stored? Can you tell us what level of event your new evaluation standards will be since a 7.0 magnitude event is approximately 10 times the force of a 6.0 event and my understanding is that geological records for the earthquake magnitude in this area go back only about 350 years, which is a blink in geological terms. Can you tell us what steps will be taken to look for smaller but potentially dangerous levels of damage to things like pipe wells, cracked cement, compromised underground pipes, or other internal structures if an earthquake occurs? In other words, the seismic issue is not simply that there might be a big one, so that's far from a trivial concern. The real threat is that vibrations from a quake can cause unseen, unknown damage to plant internals, weakening piping, fraying wires, loosening welds, creating fissure cracks in some component or another, and everything still looks fine. Then a year or two, or even 10 years later, there's a problem at the, at the plant, and instead of working as planned or expected, that weakened part cracks. Can you assure the public that the high pressure gas lines of the Algonquin pop, pop, pipeline that circumvent Indian Point can withstand the size events that are estimated by Lamont Doherty? And since there's a proposal to expand those pipelines to 42 inches, will that affect your seismic safety calculations? That's my first issue. So, Mr. Uh, Shaw. Will I be called back for other issues? Because I have many others, and I have it in writing, and I would like response. Yes. Let it speak. Let it speak. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, and I appreciate you managing the time. Thank you. In your probabilistic risk modeling of severe accidents, does the NRC include the outside environment and economic data that sh should the unexpected happen? Specifically, does the agency use the same set of criteria for each nuclear plant to determine probabilities of a severe accident based on reactor design and output capacity? In plainer terms, does 20 million people living or working within the 50 mile radius of Indian Point and the $8.5 trillion in real estate value alone carry any additional weight in your probabilistic modeling compared to the Wolf Creek Generating Station in Burlington, Kansas, or the Cooper Nuclear Station in Brownville, Nebraska, both of which have sparse populations and relatively little economic assets within 50 miles? If so, can you explain the weighting system? And finally, 
Since no nuclear plant in, this US, in the US was ever designed for indefinite storage of nuclear waste, how far above original design basis is currently stored in the spent fuel pools? Since the spent fuel can be moved into dry cask storage after just a few years, and a 2003 report co-authored by your current chairman, McFarland, concludes that spent fuel storage is safer in separated dry casks than the overcrowded wet storage pools, why has such a small percentage of eligible fuel assemblies been moved into the safer storage containers? And exactly yeah. how many, I would like to know by what factor, exactly how many times above what the pools were designed for is currently stored in the spent fuel pools. And this relates to what just happened last week in Vermont, where Administrator Dean said that those spent fuel pools had seven times the design basis in them. So I'd like those questions answered, and I'd like them in writing, and I will leave copies with each and every one of them. Thank you. 
second. Can I, if you can wrap up, I can call one more person up. I'll wrap up. Okay. Since I've been waiting, since I've been waiting 30 years. It's your years call. To it's your call. I hope you'll bear with me about my neighbor. I know a lot of folks want to speak. It's that okay. We all know that there is no forgetting how the risks of over storage locally. There is no permanent storage for nuclear waste, uh, for high level nuclear waste. It's, if you ask someone to look back in 30 or 40 years at what we were doing, meaning piling up high level nuclear waste without knowing what the heck to do with it, they're not going to believe that we were rational people. Uh, right. uh, and indeed, we're not being rational That's by doing right. that. The Price Anderson Act absolves Entergy and every other nuclear power plant owner of any liability after $2 billion. That means that of that few trillion, they pay $2 billion and they're done. 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 Finished. Now, that's, not, that's, not, that's only because Entergy lines the pockets of our congressmen until they continue renewing that. And I use that advisedly. I'm not naming any one Congress, but they line enough to buy the votes. And it is to our everlasting shame of the nation that an industry can buy our Congress and keep it in its pocket. And okay. So we are going to move to the NRC so they have an opportunity to respond. Can I... Um, yeah, but I want to close with one thing. Yes, sir. It is unbelievable that there is no written, recorded, or other yes. record. Yes. It invites lack of accountability, and I would go so far as to say, instead of hiring Sundiva, instead of hiring Sundiva, they should have used that money to hire a transcription. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to offer you an opportunity now to respond to those comments. You know, there were quite a few uh, comments and questions, and I can sort of separate some of what I heard because not all of it was associated with spent fuel. Uh, in a minute, I want to turn it over to uh, Mike Scott, who's going to talk about spent fuel. But there was a number of uh, other issues that uh, sort of came up, and, and we'll, we'll address it uh, accordingly. Because the came up, and we will talk about the Fukushima aspects. Uh, I know that the question of uh, surge, storm surge, and uh, Sandy, just, just, just to be clear, uh, you know, Sandy, the storm surge at Indian Point uh, was uh, 9.7 9 feet. And actually the plant was original design is uh, 15 feet. Uh, so even for uh, uh, Sandy, that's significantly above. And there has been some reanalysis that it's going to be even three feet higher. And again, that's part of the Fukushima uh, lessons learned. Uh, a, couple, a couple of... Uh, a couple of uh, other items. Uh, you know, I, I don't want you to take the fact the way that you know, uh, Bill Dean not being here is meant to be any kind of message other than, you know, part of it is, you know, for, uh, you know, he was here the last couple of years. I think I was here, here the year before that in 2011. And that's part of him and, and me as a deputy in terms of uh, for us to be engaged in these activities. Uh, and, and part of our, you know, development and so forth. So that's not intended to be anything. Uh, Hard to understand to you. Could you please enunciate and speak more clearly into the microphone? Okay, thank you. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Uh, now, uh, relative to uh, you know the the other aspects, we talked about some Tiva and and the, and the public record. Uh, you know, I, I think many of you may have heard the webcast yesterday. You know, you know, really, you know, we are we are looking at our, our body and decision making. Decision, you know, decision making means we do record. You know, we have not done so with uh, with respect to uh, informational means, which is this is intended to be. That said, uh, the chairman has asked us to take a look at how we do communi uh, public communications and to try something new and different. And so in the, in, in the, in the pen, of the chairman, and she passed it off to William Dean, who sent me a letter saying that the public record of these kinds of meetings is not worth the budget of the NRC. Oh my God. So, I need that budget instead of a Michelle Bach. So certainly we will go ahead and review that. And, and, and so part of what we want to do is we're trying to we're trying to do better outreach. 
we really are trying to Lots of luck with that. And, you know, when you were talking about facilitator, you know, when we look at it, you know, in terms of resources, whether it's money or, or people, you know, we're saving on the, on, on the people. So, you know, I think our intent, the message I just want to get across to you is, you know, our intent is to try and do better outreach to the, to the, tent, to the extent that we can. Uh, and we'll try and answer all the questions that we can in this uh, format. So with that, uh, let me turn it over to Mike to talk about Spent Shield. Okay, can everybody hear me clearly? Yes. Okay, great. So as uh, Dave indicated, I am going to uh, attempt to respond to uh, the questions that regarded uh, spent fuel and uh, I, I highlighted the ones that uh, I thought fell within that category so hopefully I'll capture those. Uh, the first question I think uh, came with regard to uh, how much spent nuclear fuel is in dry storage in, uh, at, at India Point and, and also I think by implication how much is in uh, the spent fuel pools. Uh, my understanding, and these are approximate numbers, is that there are approximately 1,000 spent fuel assemblies in storage containers on the, in the dry cask uh, storage facility. Each container, I am, uh, uh, understand, is, contains 36 assemblies, approximately. So um, that's roughly, you can, you can infer from that how many uh, canisters are out there. Uh, each spent fuel pool, and they're not, again, these are not precise figures, has on the vicinity of about 1,200 fuel assemblies. So about... How many times? How many times? Do the math. Can't do that math. I don't know how much each assembly weighs. Why not? Why not? How about a percentage? The next question that was on here is why was the licensee not doing more to move, or why are we not doing more to require license, the licensee, this licensee, to move spent fuel to dry storage? Uh, you may be aware that the commission recently undertook an evaluation of the relative safety of uh, dry cast storage versus uh, storage in a spent fuel pool. And the commission concluded that both methods of storage are very safe. The it's whatever you want. Do you have a strong objection to that? It's the chairman stands behind the 2003 report coming out of MIT that she co-authored along with Bob Alvarez, formerly of the Department of Energy, and Gordon Thompson, who's a specialist on spent fuel, and they all signed off on the 2003 report that said that dry cask storage is far safer than overcrowded spent fuel. <laughs> so the recently completed NRC study of this matter concluded that, and again this is made in comparison with the NRC's health objectives, one of the NRC's health objectives is that the risk to the public posed, posed by the operations of nuclear power plants is one is less than one tenth of one percent of the risk that public people that the public is exposed to in their daily lives. This recent study concluded that the risk of the risk posed to the public by storage of spent fuel in spent fuel pools is one tenth of one percent of the one tenth of one percent. Roughly one in a million of the, of the risks that people are exposed to in their everyday objectives. On the basis on the basis of that study and the NRC's conclusions regarding it, the NRC could not justify a, a, a requiring the licensee to move the fuel to dry storage and is required by the existing regulations. Something happens with the spent fuel that is a real problem. With cash, not so much. So I feel like some of you want to hear these answers, and I feel like some of you are probably a little less prone to that. So it's not to answer. It's really hard to answer when someone's talking on top of you. When you're speaking, I really don't want to interrupt you, and I just want to ask you guys to do the same. When someone's speaking, would you stop and hold on? So I need a lecture. Go back to Virginia. Maybe 
Okay, the next question was with regard to uh, high burn up spent fuel yes. and yes. concerns with regard to that. Um, as you may be aware, uh, high burn up spent fuel typically is speaking of uh, fuel that's been uh, irradiated in cores to the extent of over 35,000 gigawatt days per metric ton of uranium. And um, the NRC has licensed storage containers for high burn up spent fuel. So the NRC would not allow such fuel to be uh, irradiated, or irradiated and or stored in cast facilities not if we had not, if we, if we had not uh, done the appropriate analysis. So the analysis is there to support the storage. Now, the question came up about, what, uh, let me make sure I get this right, uh, how, how do we safeguard that for, I think the number that was used was a quarter of a million years. And as you may be aware, the uh, federal government has had a program to cite a repository which would be licensed to, uh, to handle, handle spent fuel, including high burnout fuel. The government made the decision in 2009 to restart uh, that program under a different method uh, of informed consent. And, and that current that uh, evaluation is ongoing by the government. So it, it would be correct to say that the government does not, as we sit here today, have an established repository. That's a fact. The NRC has, the NRC has concluded that spent fuel can be stored safely for extended periods. Now, as you may be aware, the uh, NRC had a rule referred to as waste confidence that was uh, that stated the NRC's confidence that spent fuel could be stored until a waste repository could be cited and placed into operation. A, por a portion of that rule was remanded several years ago, and the NRC is currently going through a rulemaking process to consider the inputs that have been provided and update that rule. So that rule has not been updated yet, and uh, so our, uh, our rulemaking is pending on that matter. On the generic environmental impact statement, generic. Against the people, against health. How much fiber of fuel is there in the environment? At the spent fuel and the question, please. Well, the next question. question that is on the list is, <laughs> How far above the original design basis is spent fuel pool dry store or spent fuel pool storage? And the answer is significantly above the original design basis. And as a result, in order to in order to allow that amount of spent fuel storage, the agency has authorized licensees, including Indian Point, to make changes to the spent fuel pools to provide additional absorber material to allow the uh, additional spent fuel to be sourced to be stored safely. That's the question that is, places that there already was some. That was just in the journal news a few weeks ago. I'm sorry, say that again. I didn't hear you. Go, go and pick up one of the the articles from the that quote the NRC, where the workers in Indian Point tried to place additional spent fuel assemblies in pockets in the pools that already contained them, and they tried it twice. Not once, but twice. Yeah. I'll get it for you right now. We're aware of it. You don't need to do that. Let him speak. How much higher fuel is it? A couple of things. Let, let me let me let me try and do this. I I, I do wish that we can uh, try and have have a discussion. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, you know, I know Gary's getting getting the report, but that was uh, actually a spectrum issue, which one of our residents I actually uh, looked at. We can try and uh, catch that. Uh, when Gary gets back. But one of the things that, you know, in terms of the, the amount of uh, high burn up fuel uh, that you talk about, you know, we have been, you know, uh, we have been advised by our security folks that that is security sensitive information. So we do not provide in D.C. and they have said this is not a security issue, that each resident inspector and each plant knows the amount and they can tell us. 
It is not a security issue. So that's a PR thing. We would like the answer. How much hydrogen fuel is at any point? We have the right to know where the reactor community. Please tell us. L let me take that back. Okay, that's my understanding from our Office of Nuclear Security and Incident Response. That that information is security sensitive. Right. That's it. We'll go back and we'll verify because we're hearing something different. Right. Did you want to speak to us? Did you want to speak to us? Please call me Carly. Call up the other people. Let me let me uh, let me get back to the the few mishandling and perhaps. No, he's watching the Ranger game. Let me be clear. Okay, let me be clear right now. I mean, this is, I mean, this, there really, really is a, a lack of respect here. Yes, sir. sitting next to a manufacturer of a pill, a thyroid pill, and it's called ice, uh, Isat. I want to know if you have heard of it or you have it. I want to know from every one of you people if you have it. And I want to know from everybody here if they have it. Uh, I, I, I'd like to answer that question if I might. Uh, I live within an emergency planning zone for nuclear power. Uh, I, I could obtain that material. You're referring to potassium iodide. But you know about it. Uh, now, when I talk to people, I'm a, I'm a planner of a town here. When I talk to people about this thyroid pill, in case of an emergency, nobody knows about it. There aren't enough in the hospitals. They're not given out by doctors. But the everyone in your commission has this and knows about it. Now, we put down statistics to show how many pills have been sold in this area. And what has happened, and if I ask anybody in this audience, are you sitting with this pill in case of an emergency, they're going to say no. Right. Many of them will say no. We shouldn't people, have to buy that. People do not know about this because it, and it is a necessity. Now, I am a planner of a town which is 15 miles away from here. Speaking it's called Sol Mike 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 senior citizens living in a place called Heritage Hills. Heritage Hills is a lovely place, but God forbid if there's an emergency, I as a planner have never seen an emergency or an evacuation plan. How are 4,800 senior citizens who live in 2,100 houses gonna get away 15 miles when they don't even know what's going on? And I think that you people have to start doing your job. Thank you. 
Do you really think a bus is going to show up? It doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or a Republican. It doesn't matter if you think nuclear power is a good thing or not. We deserve a viable plan to evacuate this area if something should happen in Indian Point. Who's spearheading this effort? separately some of the issues that you have a, a concern with and one of the things that I, I want to say is that you know we do take our job seriously and one of the things that we have done is we've, we've gone out and we've studied real evacuations similar to Katrina and we look at the the effects and the impacts of what people will do and what people won't do and we recognize that Indian Point in conjunction with the state and the local officials want to protect you and they'll do everything possible to protect you. Oh. <laughs> and as such, what we do is we, we evaluate their capabilities. We just went through uh, enhancements to our regulations to require them to take these types of things into account such that they can be able to use this as a tool to effectively... I think if you, if you, can, if you can let, let Kevin speak, that would be important for him to talk. I think we've, 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 we've allowed you to show the film, film, we've changed the format. Let's try and have a little stability here and give him a chance to talk. Thank you. Let him finish. And through a variety of, of, of options, we, we do work with FEMA. We also work with the licensee to ensure your safety because that is our mandate. You know, the, the whole reason... Let it finish. The whole reason that we come out here is because of you. And we, and as uh, Doug has, as David said, we take the things that you say, we take them back, and we do take these things seriously. So as we go through our process, these are things that we want to do. And yeah, I, I watched the film. And, and, and what I recognize, and what we recognize is that these things are put in place to protect the people. What? This, this is through the effective use and, and interface with your local law enforcement as well as your emergency planning officials. drills! Let's let him speak, please. Please let him speak. Please let him speak. Thank you. 
Okay, Michelle. Yes, okay. So we've got three people in the queue, right? Thank you. Um, okay, so we're going to start with Michelle. Michelle, you're going to give us your first talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, Philip, Tom, and uh, Kevin. You guys are queued up. I'll just call two more rows so we get going here. Let's go a little faster. All right, first off, my name is Tom. I do work at Indian Point. I've worked there for 31 years. I'm not an office worker. I actually walk out in the field. I've been next to the reactor. I've been down in the reactor cavity fixing the transfer kit, the transfer cart. All right? I have a lifetime dose of 15R. So tell me all about cancer. My wife got it. I didn't. I have kidney, I have diabetes, I have asbestosis, and I have some kidney problems. I have no cancer. 31 years, right next to the reactor. So when they stand there and tell you about the Tooth Fairy junk science, which is what Westchester called it, they are lying. A few more, you have to indulge me because this meeting has been a shame. Yes, you let them go all out, all over the place. All right, let's start with the credibility of some of these people. Mr. Shaw handed out two cards at your last meeting and then asked for a substitute like he did. Now they don't want to hear from me. Yeah. All right, Marion Ellie went on Yes Vermont Yankee and tried to pass herself off as Roger Witherspoon. One fellow, Marion. You want me to show it to you? Oh, Lord. Oh, I know. Patrick Coward, attacking individual. Inside the stem fuel building, we have a structure for a 20-ton crane. Anything that hits the stem fuel building still has to go through that 20-ton crane structure. And on top of that, it's a very small target. I would go into New York City immediately instead of trying 30 miles out. All right. Uh, 31, 8 million people. I got a question for the audience. Who here is from Manhattan? Hey. Brooklyn? Yes. Brooklyn's in the house. Manhattan, Brooklyn? Oh, out of 8 million people, how many did we get to show up? You know why it's here? Oh, I don't want to hear it. No, no, no. no, no, no. 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 If it was such a big no. cause, it would happen. Okay, can you wrap up in As far as a tsunami happening at Indian Point, our emergency diesel generators are located on 72 foot, three of them. All right? A 40-foot tsunami would not touch them. Sorry, we would have backup power. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Right after Kevin, Teresa Knickerbocker, if you could queue up, and Vicki Fox. Go ahead, Kevin. Hi, I'm Kevin McClung. Uh, just one question. Uh, the peak scale waste power plant is adjacent to your facility. The uh, peak, scale, peak scale waste power plant um, is adjacent to Indian Point, it's in Charles Point, and they're requesting a modification of their permit um, to discharge, I believe, more <coughs> warm water into the Hudson. I wonder if the warm water that Indian Point discharges, does that have any impact of both together? And if you'll look at that as both together. Thank you. Okay, either, just, just in terms of uh, the uh, discharge uh, temperatures from the plant, that's regulated under the uh, Department of uh, DEC, New York State. Uh, and uh, you know, relative to their limits, uh, their, they comply with their limits. So you know, really with, with regard to discharge, that's not within our purview. You were supposed to build a cooling tower. Did you build it? Okay, next we've got um, Liv Anderson, Frank Apolti. And Manager Green, thank you. A lot of this has already been covered, so I'm just going to ask the one question that hasn't been covered. Um, I'm here about the emergency evacuation, and I'm within the 10 mile radius, so I get this every year. And um, we had a question about the routes all going south, but the one question is when, when. Do you, when does Indian Point call for an emergency evacuation? Is it when the radiation is released? Is it prior to that? Just if I could have understand how how that works. 
Yeah, there, there's a detailed emergency plan that FEMA, the state, uh, and local, they coordinate, they work very hard to ensure that there's a viable plan uh, that is in place. And so what, uh, what the coordination is, is uh, New York is what's called a home rule state. Uh, so the decisions in terms of evacuation rest within the four counties. Uh, and, and they will make the decision. Uh, you know, as part of it, uh, there's communications with the licensee in terms of providing them information from the plan so that they have that information to make a, a sound decision. Norreg 0654 plan. Is that it? Yeah, new, new reg 654 plan. New reg 654, 654 plan. Yes, thank you. That's it, right? I'll be happy to show it to you if I can see it. I have. I've seen it. Okay. Next. If you've seen it, then why don't you distribute potassium iodide since the plan calls for it in the event of an accident more than up to 50 miles. So right right after this group, I'm going to ask Joe Don Montgomery to come up. And Jerry Kramer, please. And, and, and just, just in terms of uh, the potassium, potassium iodide, it's not required to be uh, distributed up to 50, uh, 50 miles. You know, we have looked at it in terms of what's the appropriate uh, uh, distance, and, and 10 miles still remains valid. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the science advisor in the White House has confirmed that. The 10 mile radius. And, and, and potassium iodide is just one of many tools in terms that's, that's available for the counties in terms of them making protective action. Where your own doctors say that that's wrong. I've got your doctors here, they say that that's wrong. Your own documents talk about hundreds of miles from the nuclear plant in the event. That's NORAD 1433. NORAD 1633 talks about the vast majority of the people at Chernobyl who got irradiated from more than 30 miles. NORAD 0654 says you will need potassium iodide if you're more than 10 miles away. NORAD 0396 says the, the government will provide it. You don't provide it. You don't have it. I have your documents. You, 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 know, you write these documents and then you ignore it. Oh. Rather than the audience, so we can kind of keep things going. Go ahead, yeah. sir. You're next. If, if I may, I, I will answer the question about oh, potassium okay. iodide. Um, we have done our, our similar studies, and when we've concluded in our regulations that the 10 miles is an appropriate distance, what we have done is the state of New York has potassium iodide. They are stockpiling. They work with your local emergency management officials to distribute that KI. What we've also looked at, we've looked at the events after Chernobyl, and we're also studying the events after Fukushima to look at that, that piece. And so we're, we're evaluating it, we've looked at it, and the, the, some of the studies that you're talking about are, are studies that are not consistent with the process that we've, we've looked at. And If I can ask you to please uh, allow the next speaker to, to, to talk. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, sir. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Frank Ippolini. I, rep I represent, on behalf of 25,000 members of the New York City District Council of Carpenters, we support the continued operation and license renewal of the Indian Point Energy Center. Indian Point has consistently been proven to be a safe place for our members to work, even after undergoing extensive training prior to assuming their plant responsibilities. Reactor operators receive retraining every fifth week on the job in order to assure their skills are finely tuned. The council believes that workplace safety is of the utmost importance and, and appreciates Entergy's strong commitment to both public and employee safety. Indian Point is also a major contributor to New York's economic recovery, providing thousands of skilled labor workers with good paying, secure jobs, including members of my union. Today's announcement confirms what we already know, that Indian Point is safe and essential to New York's economic and energy supply. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I manage Joe Green. I'm the environmental director for Hudson River State Clearwater. And I also serve on the Ulster County Legislature. And most of Ulster County is within the 50 mile so called evacuation zone. Um, 
I've been asked twice now, uh, just this evening from reporters, why if there's a, a green or quote normal safety rating or ranking this year, uh, why Clearwater is opposed to the relicensing of Indian Coin. Okay, so yeah, we got through another year, but Indian Point's track record is abysmal from an 11th month outage in 2001 uh, to leaking fuel pools, densely, uh, leaking fuel pools and densely overcrowded fuel pools, which have been mentioned, the fact that it's at the intersection of two earthquake faults and the fact that there was, and uh, my reading of the papers was an 11 foot uh, storm surge from, from Sandy, during which the plant was not proactively um, shut down in a, in a protective way. It actually, Indian Point 3 was, was triggered and shut down because there was no place for that energy to go. Indian, uh, the energy claims that they were keeping the grid happening, but in fact, the grid in New York City was pretty much down and, and, and there was no place for that energy to go, so it triggered. And, but the, the important thing is we're in the middle of a disaster. The last thing we want is another disaster at Indian Point and no one planned for that. So year after year we come and we raise so many of the same issues. I think the most useful, uh, the best use of our time would be to sit down with uh, the unions and have a facilitated conversation that was an exit strategy. These jobs, when Indian Point closes, these jobs will not be lost overnight. A few of them will, but of the 12, uh, uh, 1,250 approximately employees, there will be a very, very slow phasing out during a, a decommissioning process. We should be talking about how to safely decommission the, these, uh, this plant and how to work with the unions to ensure jobs and to ensure an exit strategy that works for everyone. Thank you. A lady over here asked me to ask about decontamination facilities that host communities would not want to accept people or their belongings unless there was a, a, a way to decontaminate uh, before evacuating the area and going into uh, a wider uh, radius. Okay. Yeah, let me address a couple of things. Uh, with respect to Hurricane Sandy, you know, uh, when that occurred, you know, the NRC, as uh, I'm sure the licensee was tracking that, and we had actually manned up the response center. It was not just in the form, we tracked that storm all the way from Region 2 all the way up to uh, the Northeast. And what we did was we, you know, in our planning, we dispatched inspectors out to the site from the region. So we had first hand observations of what the plant did. And I would say that the plan, in terms of hurricane pre preparations, there were no concerns on that part. They did the right thing, they, did, they, they, they responded appropriately. And so in terms of the trip, there was no performance deficiency that we identified. They, you know, the, the licensee appropriately uh, handled the event. And we were there, we were on site, and we looked at it, and that was our independent assessment. Trees were down. The lines were blocking the road. We were out of the next park. Sorry. What are you talking about? Were you next up? Go ahead. Let's keep things rolling. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mike. Mike, you told me. You told them. Thank you. My name is John Montgomery. I'm the president and business agent for No Right Machinery Erectors, Local 740 in New York City. The No Right Machinery Erectors, Local 740, supporting the importance of the yeah. operation. I recognize its contribution to the job creation across the state. Locally, Indian Point supports thousands of jobs, both at the plant and in the neighboring communities, many of which are held by skilled union workers. We believe that shutting down Indian Point would have a catastrophic impact on the region's economy and cause thousands of hardworking people to lose their jobs. Thank you.
Peter Wolf, Vicki Fox. Are they more union reps? Mars. More union reps. Uh, good evening. Uh, Jerry Kremer, I'm chairman of the New York Affordable Reliable Electricity Alliance. Wow. We've testified oh, here before on many occasions. Uh, we represent 200 organizations, not just labor unions, all the chambers of commerce in this entire region, a large number of businesses who strongly support the relicensing of any employment. Who founded the organization? We also appreciate the fact that this panel uh, is doing a job that's a not a very easy job. There's a lot of passion that's expressed in this place, but there's equal passion on both sides. Month after month, year after year, and the point continues to pass the test to which it's been put. This is now the 10th year in a row that your commission has given at the highest rate, rating possible, the green rating for safety in the United States of America. <laughs> Yeah. This plant in seven years has had more scrutiny than any other nuclear power plant in the United States of America, and I trust the work that you do, because if we give up on government, we give up on everything. You know, I, I heard all of you, but I sat there very patiently. I respect passion, but I also respect fairness and dignity. Uh, Indian Point has a statewide economic impact of over a billion dollars. This region relies on Indian Point for $750 million annually. It's not just jobs for union people. It's jobs for the cleaners. It's jobs for the grocery stores. It's jobs for the tire places. Indian Point, the lesson for all of us to learn in this room is the Shoreham Nuclear Power Plant. Because today, 27 years later, everybody on Long Island is still planning for the decommissioning of that facility, and they're going to be paying it for another 20 years. Uh, Indian Point also has that much more significance in light of the President's announcement this week that he's taking action to significantly cut carbon emissions by 2030. Indian Point has the least polluting type of power generating facility, very much fits within the President's agenda. And lastly, I can only say this, that we've sat through these hearings, we respect the passion of both sides, but every objection that's been raised over the years has been answered by technology, by honest assessment and reports, uh, without passion and without coloring the facts. I commend you for the job you have to do. We think Indian Point should be realized. My name is Peter D. Wolf, and uh, with a nod to the farewell party, David Letterman, I'd like to give you 10 reasons why Indian Point should be closed. The most important reason is the mismanagement of this facility. It has a history of uh, the most mishap, and it is close to the biggest metropolitan area in the entire country. And I think that the, the consequences need to be looked at. Because if there was a disaster at Indian Point, then uh, it would have such a great impact. The people around it would lose their homes, they would lose their jobs, and we can see from what happened with Katrina, we can see what happened with Sandy, that with all due deference to the government, they're not equipped to handle this type of emergency. Number two is terrorism. Um, it was brought out uh, recently that uh, Indian Point has not adequately addressed this threat. And uh, you can tell from this example with the uh, person who came within, uh, with the boat and with the plane. But you can also see it with regard to the uh, people who were released uh, from the security uh, detail at Indian Point and what their testimony has been in the lawsuits against Entergy. The third reason is the natural event. I won't go more than, than to say that the, uh, those two fault lines are very significant uh, and the potential from the Montori 7.0 earthquake and the initial design of 6.1 is really substantial. Also, the 
fact that that natural gas pipeline passes by there and, and the effects of any kind of a seismological event has not been determined. The fourth reason that the new point should be shut down uh, is that I don't think that there is adequate government oversight. I addressed this last time. I don't see why Entergy should be granted all these exemptions. In my view, Entergy should have the, the responsibility of making that plan absolutely as safe as possible, given the fact where it's located. Yeah. Do you want to pause and have a response to your first few comments? No. No. No, 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 no
and looked at the venting system, which failed, and assessed that there was a, a number of nuclear power plants in this country that had the same type of venting system, and recommended to the NRC that this be rectified, and the NRC commission voted it down. So it's that type of an issue that I'm referring to. And, and I think uh, Rob Scholl, who's actually the director of the Fukushima Vessel Select Director, he can touch on the seismic as well as your issue here. And so let me uh, turn over to Rob, if you can address this issue, and, and Rob, you touch on the uh, gas line. Can you hear me? Okay. So I'll touch vents first. Um, the vents uh, that were being discussed are related to boiling water reactors, uh, which Indian Point is not. Um, the NRC ordered in March of 2012 that boiling water reactors with Mark I and Mark II containment designs, of which there are 31 in the United States, needed to upgrade the vent designs that they have or install new vent designs to ensure that they could vent uh, following a uh, accident at the nuclear power plant. So they're in the process of doing that. We propose to the commission um, that we modify that order and expand it to include a filter on the end of the vents for that design. Um, the commission directed us to take a phased approach to pursuing that activity. They directed us to require the 31 reactors to install what is called a severe accident capable vent, one that could be operated in the condition where the core was damaged, and to pursue a rulemaking activity to look at imposing a filter design or other mechanisms to filter out radioactive materials should a severe accident occur. So we're in the process of doing those. We issued the order to require those 31 reactors to install that severe accident capable vent, and they're moving forward. They owe us their plans for how they'll do that at the end of this month, and we'll review those plans. With plan. but, but you see, there, there's a timeline here, yeah. and, and uh, you know this is going back and forth, and that danger exists. I mean, there are, uh, you know, we're here to talk about any point, but there are a lot of, of nuclear facilities that have other types of potential uh, hazards, such as flooding, for example. There, there are a number of them that are, are you know, if, if there was a major flood, uh, that uh, they could be overrun and that the event, uh, you know, should be addressed immediately, it seems to me. So there were 12 of our chief. Uh, Fukushima lessons learned in 36 sub recommendations. The NRC prioritized those and moved them into three tiers, uh, which were moving aggressively on the tier one activities, which include things like uh, flooding and seismic reevaluations in all the nuclear power plants. Indian Point has submitted their reevaluations. Those are a matter of public record. They're on our website, and you can review them. We're in the process of reviewing those. They're looking at doing the next step of the analysis, which is whether any safety enhancements need to be made at the nuclear power plants. There's a detailed schedule for that on our web page, and they owe us submittals related to those. So we just received their seismic analyses. We're in the process of reviewing those right now to determine what uh, additional analyses and activities need to be done at any point. Thank you. Regarding the gas pipelines, can you hear me? No. no. Oh, yeah, the pipelines. Regarding the gas pipelines, yeah. regarding the gas pipelines um, the ones that run across the property have been previously evaluated by the utility, and we have looked at those studies and confirmed that there would be no impact on safety related structures at the site. Utilities are required to evaluate any hazards in the vicinity of the site, whether they're existing or new hazards and remediate those hazards. That has been done with those gas lines. But I understand, I understand that this falls under FERC, and that part of what's going on with this particular pipeline is that there used to be actual visual inspection of these things, and now it's being done supposedly by uh, aircraft and machinery, and so that if, if there were an incident, and, and again, it, it's much more likely that you're going to have a, a seismic event like happened in Virginia. We, we don't know what the impact is on that pipeline. We don't know what the impact is, uh, for example, if it were a, a leak that was starting and that something, uh, you know, detonated that leak and it caused an explosion, what would be the impact of that on Indian Point? That, that's exactly what has been studied. Um, we assume that the pipes would fail in a number of different ways and confirm that there would be no impact on safety-related structures. And, Could I have a minute on it? Is that the Algonquin pipeline like you talked about? That's a new proposed pipeline. The Algonquin pipeline 
is looking to increase their pipeline yeah. and, have, and, and have gone through property that they had no right to go through. I fought the Algonquin Company yeah. for, for, for because they went and said that they were going to have a meeting of homeowners and never notified the homeowners and were going to double their pipeline going up through Somers, New York and told nobody. When they found out that the Journal News wrote an article about it, all of a sudden they said, no pipeline anymore, they're not going to allow you. I would like this committee to go and take a look, and if it's the Algonquin pipeline that's up there that nuclear plant, what their interests are, are they going to enlarge it? There has been a proposal to enlarge that pipe. And there is a number of different proposed paths. And each of those paths, whenever they make a commitment to choose which one, will be evaluated and have to be remediated by entity. I'd like to ask one final question. Where, is, is it a public record of your analysis of the pipeline with respect to any point? And if so, where can we find The nature of this study is not publicly available. It involves security aspects. We don't have any stake in this gas pipeline. You know, we don't care whether, you know, we're not supposed to have any stake. The only equity that we have in this process is if whoever, whoever authority authorizes whatever, if it's filled, it has to be safe. It has to not impact in the important. And that's our only equity. That's what we will reveal. And I just want to make a third clear. Good evening, my name is March Gallagher and I am here um, as an individual, not, on rep not representing any organization. I live within the 50 mile zone of Indian Point. Um, I have my IOSTAT bills, so they happen to know. Um, I'm also an energy shareholder and I had the pleasure of attending the annual meeting in Jackson, Mississippi and speaking directly to the shareholders, board of directors and senior management. And I wanna share with you some of my comments to them. My concerns regard seismic risk, terrorism risk, extreme weather events, and my question here for you tonight is, you know, what is our capacity to address potential 9-11 type events? And I would like you to focus on that. I noticed it wasn't identified as one of the three main areas, so I would consider it to be an other issue, and I know it's been brought up a couple times tonight, but I could use some assurance right now. Thank you. You know, we, uh, post 9 11, there was uh, significant activities that the uh, agency undertook to uh, strengthen, uh, uh, make sure that our regulations strengthen uh, the, uh, the security. You know, we sent out a number of orders. Uh, these orders and were very specific in terms of abilities to uh, mitigate anything, uh, any any uh, any event, uh, particularly fire, which is of a uh, concern. Uh, it enhanced. Uh, enhance a number of uh, facilities, uh, defenses within the organization in coordination with uh, the broader uh, law enforcement uh, community. Uh, and there was a number of activities. Uh, these these orders were actually turned back into a rule, and that converted to a rule, I think, in the last uh, year or so. Uh, so those are in place right now. Uh, and in addition, there was significant research and uh, research that was conducted to ensure that, there, that these activities uh, that these issues uh, would would be uh, there to ensure that the plant is uh, secure. Does the does the rule that was addressed um, does that include a no fly zone around any point in the There there is communications and coordination on that. That's there is what? No. <laughs> no no fly zones and, and so forth with uh, the FAA. So there is a there is, there is a, no a no fly zone around any point. There is requirements in terms of those to airmen. That is, that is not that is not something that is required by the the uh, agency itself. Well, my, my eyes, as a, as just a citizen, recommend that it's something that you take into consideration. Yeah. Even if it, thank you. What is the rule number that you're referring to? Uh, the one in the room number is fifty HH. We'll get the number. I, I can't remember the number. Next. Uh, my name is Vicki Fox, and I'm a uh, middle school teacher at, uh, at a school that is um, just a few miles from Indian Point, Lakeland Copper Beach Middle School. 
And um, I really can't tell you how many uh, teachers and students I've met there over the years who are survivors of cancer, specifically thyroid cancer. And I was talking about this to a woman who is an aide to a uh, disabled student in one of my classes, and she said, oh, did you know that I had thyroid cancer? And I said, oh, really? So she's just another, so this year, again, I'm working with somebody who has had thyroid cancer. Um, one of my students this year, um, I, you know, I don't want to say anything too private, but while he was, while his mother was pregnant with him, he had cancer on his optic nerve and he is almost blind. And I, as I said, I just can't, I can't believe the number of teachers who have gotten cancer. Um, and it's, I think it's because they live in this area. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about the evacuation drills that we do, the nuclear evacuation drills we do at my school. Um, what we do is we basically bring the kids to a bus sitting outside the school. We load the kids onto the bus and we take attendance. And then once all the buses are filled, we then take the kids back off the bus and bring them back into the school. And nobody knows why we just do that, because obviously we're very good at loading up kids onto a school bus. That's not what we need practice with. We are never, ever taken out onto the road. And let me also say that the middle school is the last school that would be picked up. Uh, Lakeland doesn't have enough individual school buses for all of its schools' transportation needs all at once. So uh, the first kids who are always picked up are the high school kids, then the elementary kids, then the middle school kids. So the plan would be that the high school kids would be brought to, I think it's SUNY and Purchase, which of course is downwind from Indian Point, it's east of Indian Point. And um, then supposedly the buses would then come back and go to the four elementary schools and pick them up and bring them over and then they'd come back again for us in the middle school. Now I don't know where the parents are supposed to be evacuated to and um, nobody knows what to do about the fact that probably the parents would be coming to pick up the kids um, when we had 9-11 the, the parents came to pick up the kids. The parking lot was just blocked with parent cars. And of course, that was not an immediate emergency right there at our school. So um, I, I have to say, I, I really don't have much confidence. Um, and I have to say, you know, I live in Beacon, which is within the 50 mile zone, and I don't have any potassium iodide pills. I don't know where to get it. So, Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, the other aspect, and, and, and sorry about the, uh, you know, the instances of, of the people who know with cancer. Uh, that said, uh, you know, we, we have had uh, a study that did, did not identify cancer around, uh, around the United States. Uh, that was done a number of years ago. Uh, and what we have uh, done in the last few years is we have asked uh, the National Academy of Science to do another cancer study to confirm our previous conclusions. And that, is in and that, and that, is, uh, that is in progress right now. Uh, they have completed phase one uh, of that, and in fact, uh, today, the National Academy of Sciences is in New Jersey, uh, they are completely holding a public meeting uh, as they are working on phase two uh, through a pilot. So that activity is still going. But uh, today, we have no information that will say such a contrast that there is an impact can I just ask as a follow-up question, are there any plans to actually have an evacuation drill in Westchester? Can't hear you. In regards to the potassium iodide that you had talked about before, it's distributed. We provide potassium iodide to the state of New York. And the state of New York works with the respective emergency management agencies to, to distribute that in the event of an emergency. Yes, in, in, in regards to the, the evacuation plan that is developed to, to you know, for the kids and, and all that other stuff, that's something that is evaluated by uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and then they provide that information to us. 
Now, in terms of whether or not a, a, a drill where you actually have to get to the point of where you evacuate people in practice of that, that is a matter of the, of the regulation. And I, and I think the regulations don't require the public to participate. Five miles, it's about this big. Okay, I didn't know. And then one day I was running and I was looking around and I was like, oh look, five miles with a radiation symbol. What could that mean? And I had to go home and Google it. I don't get one of those where do I go packets. I actually called the NRC and asked them about their evacuation plans. It just didn't make sense. And I asked the guy, where should I go? And he didn't know. Uh -huh. I think it's arrogant 
that Indian Point did not close down during Superstorm Sandy, our point, when every other plant on the East Coast uh, shut down. And I don't care how, I, I don't argue with the safety necessarily of the workers. I don't doubt the job that they try to do every day, but it, it, the plant is safe until it isn't. And once it's not, we are all screwed. So that's the big question. One more additional things. Um, I'm going to make one statement very simply. I believe until the construction of the Tappan Zee Bridge is completed, that Indian Point should definitely shut down. Yeah. That is a major ordinary out of here. We can plan up the union, but if we have to get out and we have one lane open on the Tappan Zee Bridge, uh, we're not going anywhere. We can't go east, so that's all we say. Um, also, one other thing, um, I'm sorry Mr. Dean isn't here, um, I hope he's not watching the Ranger game. The following list of questions has been prepared by the Energy Indian Point State Energy Coalition. These are questions that we have raised for the last 14 years. Um, according to the values page on the Nuclear uh, Regulatory Commission's website, nuclear regulation is the public's business, and it must, this is your quote, and it must be transacted publicly and candidly. The public must be informed about and have the opportunity to participate in the regulatory process as required by law. Not just you paying lip service to us, not giving us a chance to speak. This should be a matter of public record. Because we went back to research when we asked this list of 30 questions that we will now show you, and we couldn't really research today because we have no record to refer to. So it is really unfair that you do not record these questions and that they are not a part of the record. I will leave you tonight with a copy for Mr. Dean. I hope you will hand deliver to it. I will have a copy for each of you. Um, the, the 30 questions range from... Why does the NRC refuse to keep public records of public meetings that identify legitimate concerns? If Indian Point is allowed to operate without a license, then what's the point of having a license expiration date? 